Thank you. I'm excited to be here today. One of the million dollar questions that organizations want to know is, how do I engage my workforce? How do we engage the employees that work for us? And so if we're going to think about how do we engage our workforce, we need to understand and get underneath the hood of what drives human behavior in the workplace. Why do people do what they do when they come to work? Wouldn't we all like to know that? Well, in our studies, we've had a central focus on motivation. We have found that motivation is key to success. So not only can we measure motivation, but we have found that there are four motivations that contribute to success. But we, in order to understand motivation, we have to understand that there are some myths around motivation. So let's dive in to the science behind what drives motivation. So one of the myths is motivation is just about energy. Motivation is the intensity that I bring to the job. Motivation is my ability to get up and come to work and just give 120%. So is that the whole story? Well, it's part of the story. The other side of the story is, yeah, it's about energy, it's about quantity, but it's also about quality. So let's think about the employee who is motivated um, very productively. They do a lot of activities at their work that causes them to bring positive outcomes in, in their day. So they, if they are a sales rep, they're generating leads, they're following up on those leads, they're closing deals, they're generating revenue for the company. Those are all positive motivations. However, some people also bring to the table negative motivations. And we all have a combination of each, both positive and negative. So those that are productive for us and those that are counterproductive. So let me illustrate the point. Mr. Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen is a great example. Is he motivated? Absolutely. Is he a great and talented actor? Yeah, no question about it. But does he come with, does he come with counterproductive motivations as well? Absolutely. And so can't we think of somebody that we've worked with over the years that is like the Charlie Sheen or the Lindsay Lohans of the world? That, you know, Charlie Sheen, he's a great actor, but he's a drug addict, he's a womanizer, he throws tantrums on the set. Don't we have coworkers that we've worked with in the past that, man, they, we think, gosh, they've got such great potential, but look at that baggage they carry. They're draining me. They come with toxic behaviors and they just suck the life out of our teams. I know I can see on your faces, you guys are kind of recalling somebody. <laughs> You've got a face in your mind. Yep, I've worked with that person. Um, and so what we want to think about when it comes to motivation is there is a quantity aspect, but more importantly, there's a quality aspect. So the success in our life is determined by elevating or maximizing our productive motivations and minimizing our counterproductive motivations. And we need to be extremely careful about when we, when we um, engineer teams because we want to make sure we're putting people that are healthy together. Neuroscientists have proven over the last five years that we as human beings are hardwired to connect. We're hardwired to connect with others. And I know you introverts in the room are going, nope, not me. <laughs> but yes, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, you are hardwired to connect. The introverts just want smaller social circles of people that they know very well. The extroverts just, whew, it's like a spray in a room. They walk into a room and the whole room is a bunch of friends they just haven't met yet. So we might have different approaches to it, but neuroscientists have said not only are we hardwired to connect, our brains will not thrive at their full capacity unless we are a part of a healthy group. Let me say that again, our brains will never be fully realized unless we are part of a healthy group. Pretty, pretty, pretty impactful for organizations. A lot of times we just kind of throw teams together and we're like, we just need able-bodied people, able -bodied people, just go, go work on that project. But the reality is if we're not careful about how we engineer, engineer our teams, we can really set the project up for failure. We like to think that if we have three high performers and we put that C player on, on that team, don't we think that those high performers are really going to take that low performer and bring them up? I mean, that's what we would just intuitively think, but what do you think the research says about that? No. It drags the top performers down. So when we have the Charlie Sheens or the Lindsay Lohan type workers on our group, they're toxic. 
they create, they create chaos around in their group. So we need to be very careful about how we engineer our teams. And the second myth is we often think that motivation is a one size fits all. So I just need to come in, I need to bring my team together, and I just need to inspire them. Right? I mean, don't we just want to like get them motivated? Let's inspire them. Well, the secret to motivation is, is that it's not a one size fits all. People have different motivational styles. So if we look at the basics of motivation and we say, okay, what really is motivation? Motivation hasn't had a lot of clarity until the past couple years, and we've really dug into what is driving that human behavior. But when we look at what is motivation, it's pretty simple. Motivation is our drive to go seek pleasure and avoid pain. So as human beings in life, we are just hardwired to go seek pleasure. We want to go get that degree. We want to go get that job. We want to go get that awesome spouse. But we're also motivated to avoid pain. I don't want trouble coming into my life. I've got to problem solve it. I've got to get it out. I don't want any, anything impacting my success. So that's our ability to um, effectively av avoid pain. So how successful we are in life is dependent on how many productive motivations we've, we have and have built over time and how effective we are at minimizing our counterproductive behaviors. And so when we look at the pleasure pain access, our research has shown that we can not only measure motivation, but we can also find, we have also identified the key factors, the key motivations that contribute to our success. And on the pleasure side, there are two. There are two motivations on the pleasure side, ambition and accountability. So if Mary over here, Mary on my team, is very driven in, in ambition. She's just the most ambitious person. I can put her on a project, and I just tell her, here's what I need you to do, and she runs with it. She is excited. She sees the world in opportunities. So that's somebody who's highly driven, highly motivated on the pleasure side. Now I've got Bob. Bob over here is highly motivated on the pain side. He wants to avoid pain. He has this uh, just innate ability to be intuitive and be watching and being a protector of the organization. And he's looking at what is everything that could go wrong. They're great at mitigating risk for our, for our companies. And so they have this innate ability that I call the power of noticing. The power of noticing. They notice clues. They notice issues that, oh, whoa, 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 hey, wait just a minute. That could cause our company pain. That could bring trouble. That could jeopardize everything that we've built. So they are highly motivated to protect what they have. They don't care as much about, I don't, I don't have the need to bring in a lot of new opportunities, but they want to protect and preserve what they have. Now, we all have a combination of both, but we tend to have a dominant focus. And this is important, because if I want to try to motivate my employees, I have leaders across the country that say, Gosh, I want to increase workplace engagement. 70% of employees across the nation are disengaged. How do I motivate my employees? Well, you're asking the wrong question. Your employees are already motivated. The question you should be asking is, how do I unleash it? How do I unleash their already existing motivation? So if I'm communicating with Mary, who's extremely motivated on the pleasure side, and she sees the world as all these wonderful opportunities, I'm going to talk to her about the benefits and all the positives that I see with this. If I'm talking to Bob, who's highly motivated to, to protect and to prevent problems and to mitigate risk, then if I go to him and approach him like I just did Mary, and I say, Bob, let me tell you about the awesome reasons that we should bring this new project on. It's, we're going to increase market share. We're going to bring in new clients. What's Bob going to think? I don't care. Now, if I don't understand Bob, as a leader, if I walk away, what am I going to think? Bob's just not motivated. Bob's not motivated. I can't get him to buy into this. I don't know what the deal is. I see all these wonderful things, and I can't get Bob to buy in. Well, the problem is not Bob. <laughs> the problem is me. I don't understand how Bob is motivated. And so I've got to understand how he's motivated, and then I know, oh, okay, 
Bob is motivated to avoid pain. He wants to mitigate risk. He doesn't care about new stuff. He just wants to avoid trouble coming. So how am I going to talk to him? How can I unleash that motivation? I'm going to go to Bob, and I'm going to say, Bob, we want to bring on this new project. But I want to go through all of the things that could go wrong if we don't do it. Here's problem X, Y, and Z. If we don't implement this change, if we don't take this project on, X, Y, and Z could happen. We could lose market share. We could lose some of our clients. Now all of a sudden, it's kind of like that movie Inside Out where the people are talking in the brain. Um, all of a sudden, boo, 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 you've got the bells going off in his brain because he hears threat. He hears pain. Now all of a sudden, whoa, what do you mean we could lose market share? What do you mean that my project could be in, in jeopardy? Now all of a sudden, we've tapped into his motivation and we've unleashed it. <clears throat> so what do we, why do we care? Why do we care as organizations? Well, we did a study with sales reps. We wanted to look at what are the key differences between the top performers and our low performers. So we assessed both the top performers and the low performers. And we were curious. We, we assessed them on 35 different traits. And we wanted to know, out of those 35 different traits, are there any consistencies that we see with the top performers versus the low performers? There was one, well, there were multiple key traits, but there was one that was just incredibly significant that pulled out ahead of the rest. And that was motivation. And it was the motivation factor on the pain side. So we often think sales reps, they're so good at ambition, they're driven by ambition. But on the pain side, we have awareness and we have agility. And these top sales reps, yes, they had high ambition. But on the pain side, they were just incredibly effective at resolving pain and about um, problem solving. It gives them that confident mindset is, you can throw any kind of problem at me, and no problem, I'll solve it. So they know that even if they don't know the answers, they can go find it. So those top sales reps had extremely high scores in that agility factor. So this is really critical for organizations to know because it's not what we've been taught. So why do we need to care about, about motivation? Well, number one, as organizations, we need to be hiring <clears throat> for motivational fit. We need to hire for motivational fit. Just because somebody can do the job doesn't mean that they will do the job on a consistent basis. And a resume only shows us what they can do, not what they will do. So we need to be looking in, diving in deeper, and figuring out what does the job call for, and is this the right motivational fit? Researchers have studied um, how we as human beings um, select candidates for hire in an, <clears throat> in an interview. And they wanted to look at, huh, I wonder um, what parts of the brain um, are decisions about hiring made? Well, it was interesting. They found that in, we make decisions whether or not to hire somebody in the first three to five minutes of the interview. The first three to five minutes of the interview, we make a decision about whether or not we want to hire that person. Not only that, the decision is made in the emotional. So if we use this as a crude representation of the brain, the thumb represents the emotional centers of the brain. The decision is made in the emotional centers of the brain. And what is our brain asking in that first three to five minutes? Would I want to get in a car and drive cross country with this person? <laughs> the answer is yes. All right, yeah, that's a, that's a good fit. So then we spend the rest of the interview trying to justify why we think that person's a good fit. So again, we're basing it on what we like. That's fine. Maybe does that work? Well, let's go to the research. What does the research say about if we like somebody in an interview, is that predictive of later performance? What do you guys think the correlation is between if I like somebody in an interview and if they will be a top performer later? Zero. Zero. That doesn't mean that you should hate <laughs> the people that you hire. But we often hire because somebody, they, they communicate like us. They're like us. We like to hire our little mini-me's. But the reality is, is that really what the job requires? And when we um, did the study with the sales reps, I was curious. So I went back to the organizations and I said, hey, can you pull the records on 
the, on the interview, I want to see the ratings you gave um, those candidates when you hired them. And I was just curious because I thought, I wonder if the ratings were any different between the top performers and the low performers. There was. It was incredibly consistent. Who do you think got the better ratings in their interviews? The low performers. We liked them more. And if you ask any of the top HR professionals in the country, they will say that they, yeah, absolutely, we never hire based on who we like. We've gotten burned by that so many times, so they've really picked up on it. So number one, we need to hire for motivational fit. We need to be testing for motivation, and we, we need to be digging in deeper on the interview to determine if they are the right motivational fit for the job. Second, we need to understand our employees. We need to understand how they're motivated, and we need to communicate with them in their motivational style. We also need to be <clears throat> bringing them in on projects that match that motivational style. I'm not going to put somebody who is very prevention focused and mitigates risk on a project that's going out and um, researching opportunities and um, new projects to bring in. So we need to start understanding our employees and matching them to the projects. And third, we need to invest in our people. We often as organizations will invest in our equipment, our technology, and our processes. We will lean and Six Sigma our organization to death, but we don't apply those same principles of continuous improvement to our people. The high performance cultures in the future are gonna be those that invest in their people. Thank you guys.